Thank you everyone for attending this session. I'm Louis Liu, the co-founder and CEO of Eigen Technologies. Today I'm going to be talking about machine learning, financial regulation, and what's actually happening today and you know, our view of what's going to happen uh, in the future. So just a bit of a quick background about who we are, what we do. We're a natural language processing machine learning company. And we effectively provide a platform where we take your masses of documents and unstructured text and we convert that into structured usable data. And obviously has massive implications in the world of compliance and regulation. Um, and in terms of the documents that we process, we, anything from you know, legal contracts, loan documents, you know, derivatives contracts, through to onboarding documents, shareholder agreements, emails, etc. And we do this by using some very novel mathematical approaches and, and machine learning approaches that makes it adaptable and scalable. So a little bit really quick introduction about the business. Uh, we're about 100 people now, over four to five years old, backed by Goldman Sachs and Tomasek. Uh, Goldman was actually a, a customer of ours for about 18 months before investing um, across London, New York. Uh, we work with many different industries, uh, insurance, like uh, companies like Hiscox, legal, like companies like Allen Overy, but our predominant sector is in the financial services space. And actually, regulation, reg tech, is a huge part of our revenue base. Um, so actually, uh, we do work with four of the big six U.S. banks and about 50% of the big European banks. So I see a lot of clients here in the room. Thank you for your support. Um, great. So, so let's sort of really get into it. Of course, you can't really have a conversation about you know, reg tech and financial regulation without going back to the financial crisis. Um, and you know, even sort of 10 plus years on, I think we still really live in the shadows, uh, shadows of this. And, and sort of in particular, if we, you know, and sort of in a retrospect, if we sort of go back and do a deep dive into, you know, one of the primary causes for a lot of the turbulence, um, it's not just sort of on the market side, but, but I'm, I'm sort of going to quote this from, uh, you know, from, from Harvard Business School. You know, most of the problems evidenced so prominently during a financial crisis can be traced to failures in five manager, managerial systems, including control and IT, and specifically how information is captured and shared. And let me just sort of, sort of bring this out a little bit more. So uh, this is a scene still from, sure, we've, we've all seen the big short. Uh, the Christian Bale character here is, uh, you know, sort of exhausted reading through these ton, uh, sort of pile of collateralized debt obligations. And sort of that sort of, you know, he, he reads through all these documents to be able to get an insight into you know, exactly what's going on uh, you know, sort of in, in, these, in these products. I, mean, I particularly love the detail in the movie. I mean, this is a bona fide collateralized debt obligation. And actually, we looked this up. It's actually still in, in existence today, uh, issued by Goldman. So it's so really, really sort of like the, the detail here. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make here is one of the principal difficulties in being compliant, uh, especially around various different reporting requirements uh, or KYC, is really around taking this unstructured textual data and making data useful, right? I think I overheard a, a, uh, on, on a panel earlier, we were talking about you know, how do you actually do that, right? And, and be able to provide boundaries around this. And uh, of course, you know, we're not all Christian Bale, we're not all Batman. Um, and, and this is really difficult, right? Um, uh, so even you know, 10 years plus, I, I don't think we fully solved the problem or even recognize the scale of it. Um, first of all, you know, in order to be fully compliant with various regulations, you need, you, know, you need to get the information out, which is still really trapped today. I mean, I have, we have banking clients where the collateral documents still exist in the actual branches. I mean, physical branches. Uh, we have clients where the underlying loan documents still exist in warehouses. Um, and if you're supposed to report on that, how, how are you going to do that, right? You have trapped information. And obviously, being the, the act of reading through documents is traditionally a human task. That is extremely costly. And obviously, I think there's some really great technologies out there, including a lot of our peers. I, I think it's a great ecosystem that we're developing now, but it's still quite expensive uh, to, to do. And, and, and finally, there, there's just a lot. This A, trapped information, high cost, generates risk. 
But also, I think, we haven't quite understood the risk of machine learning AI itself as well. So there's quite a lot of sort of you know, various different dynamics going on. And you know, not to rub salt on the wound, but I think there are many who believe that we're on the cliff edge of a new crisis as well. This is actually caused by some similar sort of fixed income instruments uh, I, I, as we've seen before, right? I mean, these are just some headlines I'm sure you've seen around CLOs, junk bonds, non-performing loans, you know, shadow banking sector in China. Uh, all these things um, uh, sort of really become uh, sort of a salient point when, when you come to think about how do I comply, how do I report? And I just want to reflect on a personal story of mine uh, about this and actually what really inspired uh, you know, me to build Eigen. Uh, I, was, I graduated university in 2008. Um, I think there was a reference about fine arts. Uh, I, I actually double majored in fine art and physics, and that's sort of where it came from. Uh, but actually, I, I took my first job here in London working for McKinsey. And as a 22-year-old analyst, right, uh, a new, new junior consultant serving banks that were fe effectively failing, there's something I, you know, I, I recognize as a con constant pattern. It, it was really surprising to me, uh, I mean surprising in a British sense, American, uh, that you know, a lot of these banks couldn't quite reconcile the balance sheet data systems in their IT systems and the underlying agreements, documents, documentation contracts. And I thought this was shocking as a 22-year-old because I was thinking, well, the, you know, surely the financial system has really have all this stuff lined up. And, and, and surely, and naively, that a bank is nothing more than a pile of contracts and an IT system wrapped around it. So, so and, and, and encountering this problem really inspired me to, to think about actually are there ways of solving this, this problem. But, uh, but you know, and, and sort of, now, now let's sort of move forward to today. Right? I, I, I feel like actually today uh, we are uh, you know, developing some solutions. Uh, we are coming up with a roadmap to be able to be better at this. I think I, I really, I, I just want to be very specific and give some specific examples. So this is, um, this, this is a U.S. Uh, regulation called fin Qualified Financial Contracts. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, QFC. Uh, what it effectively requires as part of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, is for GSIBs uh, operating in the U.S., to report on all of their trading agreements, their uh, ISDAs, derivatives contracts, um, their commodities agreements, and basically answer about sort of 27 different legal and regulatory questions. Um, and, and, and actually, and what, what's important is that you go through your entire back book of it, uh, and also you need to be 24 hour compliant moving forward. Obviously, this is traditionally manual, it's expensive. It's, it's, you know, gee, I, 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 I never collected this data before on like cross default or downgrade triggers. How am I going to collect that information? Uh, but actually, I think this was really, I think, a, a pivotal moment in reg tech or machine learning because actually a lot of uh, banks, because this is such a difficult task, actually turned to technology, turned to machine learning, turned to reg tech. Uh, and we we're very lucky to be part of this space and part of this push uh, as part of the ecosystem. Um, and, and you know we do see that this type of technology is able to improve the quality access information that would be specific in a bit, and also be able to central, start centralizing your qualitative data to be able to be better at this kind of regulatory reporting uh, sort of tasks moving forward. And in fact, one major uh, banking client of ours said that, you know what's really interesting about these type of technologies? It gives me the optionality such that I don't need to worry about the future. It's almost like a hurricane insurance or something, right? When some new regulation comes on board, I can use technology to really quickly scale up and do my reporting without needing to hire a whole load of people and not understanding the mechanisms about behind that. And obviously, the, the, just going back to the QFC, you know, this comes back to a regulatory perspective, right? What the Federal Reserve and the FDIC want to do, and the reason why they require this 24-hour uh, sort of compliance, is the idea that if something like Lehman Brothers happens again, uh, one of the key informations they ask in QFC is around cross-default provisions, right? So if one part of the bank defaults, how, what is it not going to affect across the rest of the bank and across the rest of the system? So if I collect this information, I'm 24-hour compliant and reporting, at any given moment, if I, I could actually start making decisions based on this contagion effect and actually model that out properly, right? Which, which again, brings forward using machine learning uh, you know, using this type of regulation uh, to be able to uh, bring forward further transparency in the regulatory framework. 
And I, and I sort of mentioned that you know, what's particularly interesting for me, and, and, and I think for, for uh, there's this huge debate, you know, you read on the FT and, and, and the news about, oh my God, the AI is going to take over the world, it's going to eat my jobs. I think he, when we looked at the actual results for this particular regulatory reporting exercise we did for, for one of our clients, we saw that humans, the first round of review collecting this data from these documents achieved around a 70%. After a couple of iterations, they were able to achieve 92% accuracy. What was interesting was that the machine was able to achieve 91% out of the box, but the machine will highlight areas in which it's not certain, which gives it for highly qualified humans to review, which brought it up to 98%. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that RegTech machine learning is able to increase the accuracy rates of the reporting itself, and actually thereby actually reducing risk as opposed to increasing risk. Obviously, there's extremely important uh, control mechanisms behind this. Um, uh, but but that, I think that, that's, that's quite important, and it's sort of hopefully a trend that we see in the future that with higher quality information, you can make better decisions. <laughs> well, what else can you, when this kind of technology can do uh, you know, in, in the world of reg tech, uh, in, in the world of reporting? Um, and I, I do want to mention that you know we, we like to think of ourselves as a market leader in the space, but there are really you know it's a really really great ecosystem. Um, uh, so just some of the um, uh, use cases we're seeing repeatedly. I think I mentioned collateralized CLOs, non-performing loans, securitization of non-performing loans, especially cleaning up, uh, for example, Italian or Spanish or Portuguese MPLs. Um, effectively, you, you extract data from, uh, from these huge documents, you know, sort of big, short, Christian Bale style, uh, except you, know, you don't have to be exhausted on the floor. <laughs> you can have the machine do it. Uh, understanding what's debt friendly, equity friendly, uh, what are the covenances, well, you know, what is the default interest rate, things like that. Um, the, the second sort of use case that we see really prominently featured, and I'm especially excited about this one, is around risk-weighted asset optimization, right? So in the world of Basel III and Basel 3.5, we all know that banks are under sort of increasingly tightening um, sort, of, uh, sort of capital pressure, right? And, and one of the use cases we're starting to see is we, we realize that a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of CET1 or RWA release that can happen if you actually use this kind of technology. So uh, particular use cases we see that's very common is around extracting data from collateral documentation um, to be able to move uh, you know, your, your risk models, and sorry I'm a bit of a, a banking geek, uh, but to be able to move your risk models from your, the standard RWA models to the FIRB or ARB models, thereby actually releasing you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of CET1. And what, what, what's interesting here is it's not just that you know, regulation uh, and being able to be good at regulatory reporting and risk management doesn't become, it's not just a cost avoidance principle, but also revenue generating one, right? By releasing CET1, you're able to actually you know, take out more, you know, give out more loans, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the third use case uh, that we see that is very, very prominent uh, is LIBOR. Right, LIBOR, uh, you know, the BIS says that you know, $400 trillion of exposures are underpinned by LIBOR. Uh, we need to do this uh, extremely messy transition, well, ordered, sorry, I should say messy. <laughs> um, uh, sort of, well, regardless of ordered or messy, uh, a, a transition that requires everyone to look through uh, their databases, their documents to understand you know, what is the base rate, what is the default, uh, what is the you know, fallback language, what is the polling provisions if LIBOR disappears. And again, you know, you know, effectively, so much of the world's assets are underpinned by this. Imagine trying to do all this manually. So th th that's just one of the really um, exciting use cases that we're seeing you know, really at the forefront today. Now, looking to the future, I think Hopefully, I've, I've, I've covered just what, what is happening today. What can technology today do? I think these are great, right? I, I, you know, that's cool. It gives us business. It gives the ecosystem business. But it's all quite siloed, right? These are all, I'm going to do reporting on this. I'm going to, I'm going to reduce my RW on this portfolio. But what about, what if we industrialize this at scale? Right? Well, what if as an industry together, uh, from, from, you know, from, from you folks, the banking industry, to us, the, the technology ecosystem, you know, what if we work together to, to achieve sort of, I, I, I think, a better systematic solution? And I think there are basically three themes I, I, I can see coming out of this, you know, moving to 2020. 
the first is around greater transparency. I, I, you know, I think with substantially reduced costs, with, uh, with substantially reduced costs, with greater degrees of accuracy, and, and, and thirdly, with a much greater sort of audit trail, because these are done, these are done by machine and not you know, sort of manual processes, uh, the, the banks and the regulators can work together towards a greater area of, you know, era of, of, of transparency to make better decisions either on the bank side or on the regulatory side. The second point, the second theme I'm seeing here is really around regulation uh, as a strategic advantage. I think I already talked about this with RWAs, right? Um, where by using red tech in the smart way, you transform your, your business from a cost avoidance, oh my god, regulation, uh, you know, I don't want to be fined, cost avoidance, to how can I leverage reg tech to be able to do things like give out more loans, uh, or to do things like I've collected all this information about how my bank has negotiated against the counterparties. You know, every time I negotiate against this counterparty, this is what happens. I now have that data. So I can actually take the data I use for regulatory reporting and actually give it to my you know, front office uh, sort of negotiating team. So using regulation or reg tech as a strategic advantage from a revenue perspective, I think, I, I hope to see that as one of the trends. And then finally, you know, I think there's this feeling in the 2010s, especially you know, for me sort of growing up in, in my career here, that there's been sort of a, 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 a out of conservatism due to regulation around you know, a, a, a somewhat stifling of, of banking product innovation, right? Um, because of you know, the extreme capital requirements now required to do certain activities. I feel like I'm hoping that looking to the 2020s, with greater transparency and with using regulation as a strategic advantage, hopefully we can usher a new era of, of product innovation in the financial services space. Thank you. Um, I think I have five minutes to say, so quite happy to take questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we wait for the mic. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Syed, Syed Simnani from Deutsche Bank. First of all, thank you very much for an excellent session, and your enthusiasm is very clearly apparent. Excellent. Um, I was just uh, thinking about your point uh, about that um, in the end, uh, you said, how can we make sure that we don't repeat the 2008 experiment? Yeah. And one, one thing which you pointed out, that how can you make sure that uh, the banks give lots of information right, to a central authority? That's attacking the problem from one side. But how can these technologies also ensure, because I'm just thinking what I heard in the other sessions, that rather than just depending on a central authority, right, that we have these controls embedded in all the processes, I know it goes a little bit to a values debate, but it's a different, different discussion. So we have these controls embedded in all the important process itself, mm -hmm. so that I have it, the controls implemented without necessarily depending on the central authority uh, that the whole thing doesn't break down. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think um, we actually see some of our clients already moving to that direction, right? So uh, here's a really good example. Uh, I'm going to be really specific, right? Let's, let's, let's take uh, a, one of the QFC reporting requirements. Uh, sort of um, downgrade triggers, right? So, so one of the risk management controls that you want to understand is if there's a downgrade trigger on your bank, say going from triple B to BB, you have to post additional collateral, which has a material impact on your liquidity, right? Um, we're actually seeing that, uh, uh, you know, and what, what was really shocking to me was uh, a lot of these exposures, uh, you know, there was no centralized database on downgrade triggers and additional collateral posted. So actually, if you got downgraded, no one, you would not know until it was a little bit too late how much liquidity you need to provide. And we're actually noticing that people using the, these reporting requirements to centralize this type of database and actually try, you know, and actually people are either building in-house or leveraging other third-party systems to actually feeding that into their risk models. So I, feel, so I think that, that I absolutely agree with you that before it even gets to the regulators, you need to start thinking about centralizing some of these reporting requirements. Any questions? I don't bite. <laughs> cool. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, one back there. Yeah. Um, so, how realistic today, like, especially in the Mm-hmm. How realistic do you think it is to actually be able to do that with national language processing? Because I know a lot of firms are trying to do this, but it's a really challenging problem. Being able to actually read the regulatory document and turn it into code for also not even sharing that. Yeah. Not a little bit about this, but how realistic do you think it is? Yeah, it's, that's a really great question. Actually, we, we, we have partnerships with some of, the, some of the startups that actually look to do that. Um, it, it is challenging, right? Because I think the you know, from a mathematical perspective, language is, is so varied. Um, that being said, I think there is, look, I, I think basically there, there, there's sort of a short-term answer and a long-term answer, right? I think the short-term answer is, you know, for simple or, or, or easier <coughs> reporting requirements, or, or uh, you know, you, you can write specific rules, generate rules, uh, to be able to say, okay, actually, I, I need this piece of information, and that's how the logic works. I, I think I agree with you that I don't think I, 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 th I don't think you're going to be able to be a hundred percent there, especially with the reams of natural language that you need to process. But I feel like there's probably a good X percentage that you can you can automate, right? And I think the point I was trying to make earlier is you never at this point in time you're never going to be able to automate everything. I think the longer term answer is, I think, more exciting, which is related to all this world, you know, world of smart contracts, blockchain, et cetera, which is that when you actually issue a new regulation, can you already instill the, the underlying code, uh, you know, logical rules such that it's already automatable? Um, I, th I, th I think that is probably a more interesting longer term conversation to be had than of, 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 of the topics today, which we just need to take a view as to what can be automated versus not. Question here. Hi there. Um, my name is Pramila Stamp, and I'm from City Ventures. One of the question, one of the things you highlighted was how to use the technology to bring new revenue streams. Can we dig a bit deeper and give us some examples of how that could, we could use that as an mm -hmm. advantage? Sure. Um, so we're very, very active in the non-performing loan space. And uh, you know, um, so um, certain banks require, uh, are required by regulators to sort of offload their MPLs at certain rates. Uh, and one of the challenges of MPLs, especially say in Southern Europe, uh, is around uh, the fact that documents are not standard. They, they don't really have the information. Uh, they don't have the collateral information. They don't have the enforcement rights information. And you know, for example, we work with a number of sort of advisors to try to sort of securitize these, right? And one of the big revenue opportunities that we're that that we're seeing is instead of being able to do small tranches of disposals, or doing disposals at a much a sharper discount because I don't know what's in it. I'm not. I don't have time or money to look at what's in this pile of loan documents. I'm going to pay you know two euro cents on the euro for this. But if I actually know exactly what's inside these, these documents, I may be able to come at a higher price, like 20 euro cents or 30 euro cents. And working with the advisors or the sellers or, or the buyers, you know, depending on where you flow in the, in, in, in the, in the process, you know, that becomes a much more significant revenue opportunity uh, you know, for whatever party you're, you're involved with. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for a very engaging session.